Overcoming Temptations is the new series. How many have never been tempted? Raise your hand. I know that we will not get any raised hands. That's why I, the Lord put on my heart about overcoming temptation. So I said, why don't we meditate on that, you know? And uh, a quick story, you know, once, um, I think it was uh, Joshua was on the way and uh, I was meeting a friend in Fremont uh, and they gave me a goodie bag, okay, with some snacks. And I was, obviously I was supposed to drive to South San Jose and it's probably around a 30, 40 minute ride. And it was, the aroma of the snack was so enticing, if you will. And it was specifically given for Jemima, okay? I don't know whether I told you, but. <laughs> and I started eating the snacks in the car. I was tempted. And of course, there are so many other temptations. This is just one of the examples, if you will. And by the time I came, pulled in the car at my home, there was hardly any snack left for Jemima, okay? Temptations, you know? There are so many different types of temptations that we all go through. And it's okay to be tempted because the enemy tempts us and sometimes he might give us a guilt trip for being tempted. The problem is we should not succumb to the temptation. That is when it becomes sin. You know, so temptation is that which induces an individual to fall into the snare of sin. That which induces an individual to fall into the snare of sin. No, being tempted is not sin. It is sin when you succumb to it. I, I like that because the enemy can discourage you saying, hey, look, you are tempted. That is not a problem. Even Jesus was tempted and each one of us are tempted. And it's not, it's not over yet. And we will continue to be tempted. But we need to have a strategy. God has given us a strategy to overcome the temptations, you know. So I was looking up a study that was done by Barna. Barna is a researcher in the churches, an amazing researcher. I've met him uh, once at a, at a gathering where we were talking about uh, intercession and prayer. And a very interesting person who does market research in churches. So this is a little old, but I think it's still valuable. These are self-reported temptations from a survey, okay? Number one, 60% of Americans are often or sometimes living in a state of noticeable and debilitating temptation to anxiety or worry. Okay, I'm not going to ask you to raise hands, but this is just statistics. Second, 60% of Americans are often or sometimes stuck in the habits of procrastination. Okay, you might want to write down if you catch yourself procrastinating, meaning you don't do the tasks on time. You know, if a task is given, then you delay it as much as you can, okay? I know some people have that. And it's interesting how that is uh, second here. Then 55% are often or sometimes overwhelmed by the temptation to eat too much. I just confessed one of my temptations, okay? And uh, thankfully, Jemima for, forgave me for that. I hope you did, at least. Then 44% of Americans admit that they face temptations to overuse electronics and social media, such as Facebook, video games, television, Instagram, Snapchat, what have you. And then fifthly, 41% of Americans say they are often or sometimes tempted by laziness or by not working as hard as reasonably expected in their occupations. So anyway, the point is, these are self-reported temptations. There are so many that people do not want to acknowledge. We see sexual immorality in our schools today. We see the LGBT agenda really being uh, driven 
uh, forward with very few who really follow that. And pornography is there and they, they have not even been reported, I was thinking because these were self-reported. But we cannot ignore the problems that the Z generation is facing. We cannot ignore the temptations that the adults are facing. We cannot ignore the temptations and the sin which is there in the church. We'll have to call sin as sin. We cannot accommodate sin. You know, a lot of the people are afraid to talk about sin, but we need to confront sin. We need to give a solution to sin, if you will. You know, I was thinking about temptation, and even Lucifer was tempted to be like God, and he fell. And the word of God says in Luke 10 and 18, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. You know, he was rejected from heaven because of that temptation and sin. He fell into that temptation. He saw God that all these angels were worshiping God. And he was the worship leader, actually. But then he wanted to be like God. And, and that was sin. And that was, I would say, the first temptation, even before the creation happened. And even when the creation happened, we see that man fell because of temptation. Man fell because of temptation. Genesis 3 and 5 says, For God knows that in the day you eat of it, this is the interaction between the serpent and Eve, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And in verse 6 in Genesis 3, it says, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise. It was a temptation because it was pleasant to the eyes and it was for good food and it was desirable to make one wise. That was the deception of Satan to Eve. And because of temptation, the whole mankind fell. So it is very important to address this topic. You know, it might feel uncomfortable to speak on this. It might feel uncomfortable to acknowledge the temptations that we have, but there is a solution in the word of God to overcome temptations. You know, the tempter is Satan. The tempter are the demons that Satan has. You know, we even prayed about the prince of the air of America. I was, I was reading in Daniel 10, you know, in Daniel 10 and 20, it talks about the prince of Persia. It talks about the prince of Greece and how when Daniel prayed and his words were heard in heaven, God sent the warrior angel Michael and says that it took 21 days for him to fight the prince of Persia. You know, these are real things. The temptations are real because the enemy is real. The enemy is real and he wants to, steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to tempt us and, and get us away from God. He wants us to fall into sin, so we, we are away from God. You know, even the word of God says in Isaiah 14 and 12, it talks about the enemy. It says, O Lucifer, son of the morning, you who weakened the nation." You who weakened the nations, the prince of the air of Persia, the prince of the air of Greece, the prince of the air of America is there to weaken the nation. And we see that in action as we speak. And I think the Illinois House voted for a more grave abortion bill than New York yesterday, a couple of days back. I think it was May 31st. And we are, it's a battle going on. The prince of the air is there, but the prince of peace is also there. And we need to be the ones who are preaching the prince of peace, who are talking about the prince of peace to the people around us and telling them the consequences of sin. And even the government leaders, you know, in the governor of California said that if you do not have abortion in your state, you're welcome to our state. And we are calling for judgment in our state. And we need to pray for our governor. 
God is a righteous God. He is a holy God. He is not going to see sin and keep quiet. He cannot because he is a righteous God. And we have seen pockets of revival, uh, pockets of revival happen, but we have seen also pockets of judgment happen on California and beyond. We have to speak against sin. But before the church speaks against sin, are we walking with the Lord? Are we walking holy and pure? Are we able to overcome the temptations? Are we living like the world? Are we compromising? Are we people who preach the word or are we compromising and diluting the word? We cannot dilute the word of God. We cannot be speaking to please the people. We have to speak the word. We have to live the word. We have to be doers of the word. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. We cannot avoid temptation but we can overcome it. We cannot avoid temptation, but we can overcome it. You know, temptation is not a sign of spiritual weakness. We need to understand that because the enemy can deceive us, saying, hey, see, you are tempted. No, if you fall into temptation, that is when it is sin. We will never outgrow temptation, but we need to overcome temptation. Amen. You know, 1 Corinthians 10 and 13 talks about no temptation has overtaken you. Let me slow down a little bit. 1 Corinthians 10 and 13. Can we go to the verse? If you are there, say yes. Then I am going to wait. I am learning to wait and not run. I hope you are getting what I am speaking today. 1 Corinthians 10 and 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. You know, there is nothing new under the sun. The same things have happened for thousands of years. And we are not facing anything new. That is good to know, you know, because God has given us a way to overcome. And it says, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. You know, we need to understand the promises in the scripture. But of course, man has been given free will. Even despite God will make a way to overcome the temptation, man can still choose to fall into sin. You know, God did not create robots. He wanted us to make a decision, to decide for ourselves that I'm going to walk with the Lord, that I'm going to walk holy and pure, and I'm not going to defile myself, and to understand that this is sin, that this is a temptation that is coming my way, and God will always give a way out, but are we willing to take that way out is the question. James 1 and 12 says, blessed is the man who endures temptation, meaning to bear bravely and calmly. James 1 and 12. James 1 and 12. Slowing down again. It's there? Yes. <laughs> blessed is the man who endures temptation. Endures temptation to bear bravely and calmly. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life the Lord has promised to those who love him. You know, God will always make a way for us to get out of that temptation. You know, God doesn't tempt us, but the tempter, the enemy, is the one who tempts us. You know, I'm going to share with you five keys to overcome temptation. Five keys to overcome temptation. Number one, be a person who walks in the spirit. Say with me, be a person who walks in the spirit. Galatians 5 and 16. Let's go to Galatians 5 and 16. Are you learning something today? It is an important topic. I'm glad we are addressing it. Galatians 5 and 16. 
I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You know, walk means to live, to regulate one's life, to conduct one's life the way we live. We need to walk being led by the Holy Spirit. We need to walk being filled in the Holy Spirit. We need to have the anointing of the Holy Spirit so, shall, so that we shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We cannot do it in our own strength. We cannot do it with our own decision. We need the Holy Spirit to guide us and lead us. We need the Holy Spirit to tell us that here you go, the enemy is at work and then you can Walk away from the lust of the flesh. We need to walk in the spirit. Galatians 6 and 8 says, and I'll read it in the NLT version. Galatians 6 and 8. Galatians 6 and 8. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death. You know, what are we living for? How are we living our lives? You know, those who live to satisfy the sinful nature, there will be a harvest of decay and death. But those who live to please the spirit will harvest everlasting life from the spirit. We need to live to please God. We need to live a holy life because he's a holy God and he expects us to walk holy before him and he has commanded us to be holy because I'm holy. That means you are able to be holy because if he has commanded us, he has given us the way to be holy. Those who live to please the spirit will harvest everlasting life from the spirit. We need to walk in the spirit. 2 Corinthians 2 and 11 talks about how Satan can take advantage of us if we are ignorant of his devices. 2 Corinthians 2 and 11. We need to understand, when, even when wars happen, you know, a nation, let's say two nations are at war, you know what, they would have had all the information about the different weapons they have, the, uh, the number of planes, warfare planes they have, they would have already sent spies to the nation to find that information so that they know and assess what the enemy has. We need to, we know there is an enemy. We know there is a battle going on. So we need to know the devices of the enemy. We need to know that the enemy is going to put a thought in your mind to corrupt your mind. We need to know his devices. As soon as we see that, the Holy Spirit will immediately tell you there will be an alert, if you will, inside you. And then we can quickly overcome that through prayer. We can say, I rebuke that work of the enemy in the name of Jesus Christ. He has given us the tools to overcome temptation and we need to use that to the fullest. We need to understand the devices of Satan and be ready for that battle. You know, we, we do not battle against flesh and blood, but we are battling against the spiritual forces of darkness and principalities and powers. And we need to understand that spiritual warfare that is going on. And that spiritual warfare can be won only in the spirit realm. It doesn't have to be fought physically. We are not fighting physically, but we are fighting a spiritual warfare. You know, Romans 8 and 2 says, Romans 8 and 2. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. See, when we have filled the anointing of the Holy Spirit, when we have the cup runneth over experience, the power of the life-giving spirit is in us. And that power will free us from that bondage. The anointing will break the yoke. 
You know, that's why the being filled with the Holy Spirit is important. Walking in the Spirit is important. The life-giving Spirit has freed you from the power of sin. Because it's like a master-slave environment, if you will. You know, man can become slave to sin. And that happens when you fall into temptation and you continue to sin. Then you become a slave of sin. But the power of the life-giving spirit can free us from the power of sin over us. You know, the, the power of the Holy Spirit can break that bondage, can break the chains of darkness, can break that chains of habit, can break that sin from your life. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. That's why it's important to be filled with the anointing of the Holy Spirit. It's important to walk in the Spirit. It's important to be led by the Holy Spirit. It's important to hear the voice of God. Once we have that anointing, you'll hear the voice of God, even in the small things. He'll say, go to the left and go to the right, and we do that. And it will be easy for us to make the right choices. Because the enemy wants us to make the wrong choices and he is dragging even the Z generation in that direction. But then we need to teach the Z generation to walk with the Lord, to understand, to be filled with the anointing of the Holy Spirit, first to be saved and then to have the Holy Spirit in them and then to grow in the anointing so that the anointing can break the yoke that is there on the Z generation. Thank you, Jesus. We cannot do it in human strength. Number two, be a person who resists the devil. Say with me, be a person who resists the devil. Now you might say, how do we resist the devil? The devil is a defeated foe. You know, don't worry about the devil. You know, we can defeat the devil, devil which with God. You know, we are no match for the devil by ourselves. But with God, all things are possible. With the power of God operating in our lives, we can speak to the mountain and the mountain will be moved. We can break the chains of darkness with the authority that has been given to us. We can resist the devil. James 4 and 7 says, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Submit to God. Acknowledge God in all our ways. Submit to God. You know, we need to acknowledge that we cannot do it, Lord, without your strength, without your help. Then resist the devil and he will flee from you. You know, if we want to get stronger, we need to increase the resistance. I will not ask how many of us go to the gym here, okay? Uh, if you have gone to the gym, you know, you try to increase the resistance. You know, if you are going on the cardio machine and you are on the same resistance for many years, guess what? Your body gets used to it. You will not even break a sweat. I don't know if, if you have seen that. But the way we do it is we increase the resistance so that we can grow our muscles. We need to resist the enemy so that he will flee. We need to become stronger in our faith. We need to become stronger in our prayers because the fact that enemy is giving temptations to you, that means he's afraid that you're going to serve God. If he's not even tempting you, then, then there is something wrong, I would say. Because the enemy is, doesn't waste time. You will see that even mighty men and women of God have fallen. And we need to pray for the people who are influencing the nation for God. We need to pray for them because they go through greater temptations. And they need to continue to walk with the Lord. They need to resist the devil so that he will flee. First Peter 5 and 8 says, be sober. First Peter 5 and 8. And I'll wait. First Peter 5 and 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. See, that is his, that is his whole task. He is looking to devour someone who can impact his kingdom, can cause loss in his kingdom, or can 
cause a great gain in the kingdom of God. We need to be vigilant always. We need to be observant. We need to understand what the enemy is doing, what are his devices, because he is walking about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He, that is what he is trying to do. But we need to be vigilant so that we can understand what he is trying to do. But Luke 10 and 19 says that God has given us the authority to trample over serpents and scorpions and nothing by shall any means hurt us. And when we see the devices of the enemy, when we see the temptations of the enemy rising in you or in people around you or in your family, we can rebuke the works of darkness. He has given us the authority to trample over serpents and scorpions. Why don't we trample our feet twice and say, God, thank you for the authority that you have given me to trample over serpents and scorpions and nothing by shall any means hurt us. Say with me, nothing by shall any means hurt us. You know, some people are afraid of the devil. They think if we trample him, he's going to attack us. No, he's already a defeated foe. We need to know that we have been given that authority to trample over the enemy. We don't have to be afraid of the enemy because we have the authority from God. We need to know who we are. We need to know that we are king's children. We need to know that we are a child of God. We need to know that we are the carriers of God's presence, that we are his children. He is our father and he has given us that authority and we can use that authority. You know, we forget to use the authority that has been given to us. We can use that authority to resist the devil. First Peter 5 and 9 says, Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. You are not alone. You know, the enemy will lie to you. You are the only one going through temptation. But there is many others suffering and are experienced by the brotherhood in the world. But resist him steadfast in the faith. Steadfast in the faith. Because the enemy is trying to get you out of your steadfast faith. You know, even enemy tempted Jesus saying, if you are the son of God, do this. He didn't have to prove anything to the devil. But he is going to tell you, if you are the child of God, why don't you do this? You know, he's trying to remove our steadfast faith. That's what the enemy does. He'll try to discourage you. He'll try to take you away from reading the word, from hearing the word, from journaling. And you'll see that the faith will go down because the faith comes by hearing the word of God. You know, we need to continue to read, continue to speak the word, continue to encourage others around us so that we can be steadfast in our faith and we can resist him when we are steadfast in our faith. Number three, be a person, say with me, be a person who uses the shield of faith. The shield of faith. You know, we just talked about steadfast in faith. We need to resist him steadfast in faith. Ephesians 6 and 16. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts. Does it say only a few of the fiery darts? Can you read the word properly and tell me? Does it say only a few of the fiery darts? What does it say? All. All is the key word there. So we do not have to be worried about the devices of the enemy. We do not have to be worried about the fiery darts that the enemy is throwing at us because we have the shield of faith. And the faith that we have, the steadfast faith that we have will protect us from the fiery darts of the enemy. You know, in those days, the Roman soldiers used to carry shields that are as tall as them. You know, it used to be like five feet five or something. I think the soldiers were shorter those days, you know. And they used to carry the shield which will cover their entire body. 
and to gain ground what you know what they did they actually stood shoulder to shoulder and they carried their shield and they hid behind their shield and they will gain ground on the enemy that's what they did you know that's why it's important for us to be together because the enemy will try to isolate us you know if the enemy isolates us think about even if we have the shield of faith your sides are open your back is open okay it's going to be hard and of course armor of god is there and we'll address that later but my point is be together we need to use the shield of faith so that we can quench the fiery darts of the enemy you know first john 5 and 4 says for whatever is born of god overcomes the world and this is the victory that has overcome the world our faith our faith is so critical without faith it's impossible to please god you know he is looking for faith faith is what moves god our our tears of course move god but faith is the key thing that moves god whatever is born of god overcomes the world you know we see the lust of the world the pride and and the pride of life we see it out there and maybe we have fallen prey to it sometimes but whoever is born of god overcomes the world our faith overcomes the world number uh, in first john 5 and 5 it says who is he who overcomes the world but he who believes that jesus is the son of god you know without that faith we cannot overcome the temptations in the world we need to hide the word in our heart it's so important psalm 119 and 11 your word i have hidden in my heart that i might not sin against you we need to hide the word in our heart it's not in our mind you know it's not about reading the word and even memorizing the word because it's in our mind it's in the soul realm the word has to penetrate our heart the word has to go into the spirit man we need to start living that word we need to meditate on that word the way the word can go from the mind to the heart is we meditate on the word and hide the word in our heart which means you are pondering on it you are meditating on it you are thinking about it you are speaking to others about it you know it's important to keep whatever god is teaching you you tell others tell a few and it will encourage you we need to share hide the word in our heart and then psalm 119 and 9 says psalm 119 and 9 i catch myself going fast how can a young man cleanse his way by taking heed according to your word how can a young man cleanse his way by taking heed you know what heed means to keep the word to observe the word to pay attention to the word you know we need to pay attention to what the word is saying we need to keep the word we need to be diligent to keep the word we need to be diligent to observe the commandments in the scriptures and the word of god is is what basically the shield of faith is if you will that will enable you to quench the fiery darts of the enemy and remember even when jesus was tempted he just said it is written it is written you know the enemy also knows the word we need to know the word a little better than the enemy you know i think there is a there is a drought of knowing the word in america and all of us need to really go back into the word you know we like to read other books sometimes you know and maybe we are ignoring the word of god if you do not have time to read the word i recommend do not read any other book this is the first priority you know because as you read it god is speaking to you it's a mirror god is showing you where you need to change god is encouraging you is increasing your faith he is speaking to you the rema word for that day he is giving you the shield of faith so that you can overcome the temptation you know psalmist 
says in Psalm 119 and 97, Oh, how I love your law. Oh, how I love your law. It's my meditation all the day. And I was challenged when I read that verse. Oh, how I love your law. Do we really love the word of God? Do we really read it with great passion? Or are you just finishing your day's reading and you're just going through it, maybe you're not even understanding it. Take the time. It's not about finishing your U version reading for the day. And of course, we need to finish it, but it's not about just racing through it. Do we really love the word of God? Is it our meditation all day? You know, it's the, the word of God. If it's our meditation all day, the, the peace of God will descend upon us and we'll be able to overcome any fiery dart of the enemy. It will be quenched. You know, it will be of no impact. Yes, the dart might come with fire. You know, in those days, they used to, uh, in the, in the war time, they will, um, in the, on the arrows, they will put some fire on it. And if it hits the soldier, you are done. It's a fiery dart. It's a dangerous weapon of the enemy. But then the word of God says that the shield of faith will quench the fiery dart. There will be of no avail. It might come towards you, but it will be quenched because you are carrying that shield of faith. It will not hit you. It will not hit you at all. Job 22 and 22. That was a very interesting verse I saw. It says, receive Please, instruction from his mouth and lay up his words in your heart. You know, receive, he says, please. I like the way it has been written. Instruction from his mouth, from the mouth of God. We need to receive and lay up his words in your heart. You know, we need to have the word of God in our heart, not in our mind. You know, sometimes we know this word. Maybe we can even repeat it by memory. But is it in your heart? Does it really, do you own that word? Has it become a rhema word for you? Do you embrace that word? Do you, are you able to say, yes, this is the word for me today? You know, we need to have so many verses in our heart and lay up words in our heart. Number four. Number four, to overcome temptation is be a person, say with me, be a person who pursues your assignment. What is your assignment from God? You know, what has the Lord asked you to do? You know, in the kingdom of God, even in the workplace, what is your assignment? You know, we need to understand that and pursue it. Because if we do not pursue it, we can fall into temptation like David fell into temptation, 2 Samuel 11. And it says, it happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to the battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. But David remained at Jerusalem. And we know the story about Bathsheba. We will not go into the details. But the point here is, be a person who pursues your assignment. Do not go away from your assignment. In springtime, all the kings were fighting these battles. But David remained at Jerusalem. And he fell into the temptation. And there is a repercussion for falling into sin. Yes, God forgave David. You know, but David repented of his sin. That's why God was quick to forgive him. But there was a repercussion for David's life. There was a repercussion for David's life. 2 Samuel 12, 10. 2 Samuel 12, 10. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. You know, we see that David's life was surrounded with so many battles because it was a repercussion for 
for falling into sin, for falling into that temptation. The sword shall never depart from your house. In fact, there was so much bloodshed in his family and in his life that the Lord did not allow him to build the temple. But God was gracious to him and called him, he's a man after my own heart. You know, you know why? Because David quickly asked for forgiveness and he told the prophet Nathan, yes, I have sinned against God. And that is what we need to do. Even those who are watching over the internet and all of us, you know, even if you fall into that temptation, there is a way out. There will be repercussions, but there is a way out. Do we have a heart to art of repentance? Do we have a heart to say that, yes, I have sinned against God. Yes, I have fallen short of the glory of God. Yes, I have not kept the word. I have not been a doer of the word, but I have gone away from the instructions that God has given me. And God is willing to forgive you, even those who are watching over the internet. If you are saying that I, have, I am in sin right now, and I've fallen into temptation because of the desire of my heart, because the tempter came and tempted me, and I'm living in sin, I'm here to tell you that God is willing to forgive you. God is waiting for you. He is running to you to forgive you and to embrace you and to bring you back into the kingdom of God. He is willing because he's a merciful God. He's a gracious God. He's willing to forgive you even as he forgave David. But there is repercussions of sin. We cannot avoid that. There will be repercussions, but God will forgive you. Thank you, Jesus. And finally, number five, be a person, say with me, who makes a decision to walk holy. Who makes a decision to walk holy. You know, it is our decision as well. Let's not wait until the temptation comes because we know the temptation will come. We shouldn't wait until it comes, but make a decision. It's a decision. You know, Daniel 1 and 8, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. He purposed in his heart. He made a strong decision in his heart. He told himself, I'm not going to sin against God. I'm not going to defile myself with the portion of the king's delicacies and the wine. Because those animals were offered to the idols as sacrifices. That's why Daniel knew that he was a captive in Babylon. He knew how the things worked, that the animals used to be sacrificed to some of the idols, and then they will make those into food. And that's what he was saying here. He was saying, I will not defile myself to something that has been offered to idols because I want to serve the living God. I am a child of the living God. I am a person who is going to be purpose in my heart not to defile myself. And even the Z generation today, I challenge you to receive the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart and to make a decision in your heart and God will bless you beyond what you think or imagine. He'll do exceedingly abundantly of all that you ask or think. And Daniel, because he made that decision, even though several hundred thousand people went into captivity in Babylon, it was Daniel who was chosen to run 108 nations. You know why? Because God will see if the entire generation is walking in sin and if you're the only one saying, I will serve God, I will walk with God, I'll be holy and pure, God will take notice of that and he'll lift you up. That's what he will do because the decision that Daniel made lifted him up. And he was running 108 nations, not only under one king, but under three kings. It doesn't matter if the leadership changes in your company, it doesn't matter if there is a new CEO, God will keep you around the kings. He'll give you access to the kings. He'll give you the giftings. He'll give you the opportunity to be counselor to the kings. But he's looking at our heart. Do we have a heart that is purposed not defile ourselves. To 
do not defile ourselves. You know, Job 1 and 8. Then the Lord said to Satan, you know, the enemy goes to the Lord to ask if he can test us because God knows the end from the beginning and he is the all-powerful God. And here in that interaction between the Lord and Satan, have you considered my servant Job that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. You know, God will take notice among the seven plus billion people on this earth like he noticed Job. This was God's recommendation and his analysis of Job. There is none like him on the earth. He is my servant and God is proud of Job. And he's saying a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. God will take notice of you who has made a decision to walk with the Lord. Job made a decision in Job 31. You know, it says, I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? That was Job's purpose in his heart. He purposed in his heart that I am making a covenant with my eyes. And he, and the verses go on and on in Job 31. We might not have time to address all the verses, but maybe we'll look at a few verses here. For what is the allotment of God from above and the inheritance of the Almighty from on high? Is it not destruction for the wicked? You know, God cannot see sin. If he sees wickedness, he is a perfect God, he is a holy God. He will judge sin. Is it not destruction for the wicked and disaster for the workers of iniquity? But I like how Job is challenging and he knows that he is walking holy before God, you know. And then he goes on to say, verse 4, Does he not see my ways and count all my steps if I walked with falsehood? You know, God sees everything. We cannot hide from God. We might hide from somebody else. We cannot hide from God. And then... It says, or if my foot has hastened to deceit, let me be weighed on honest scales. You know, he's a man of integrity saying, let me be weighed on honest scales. He's so confident that he has walked with God, that God may know my integrity. You know, if my step has turned from the way or my heart walked after my eyes or if any spot adheres to my hands. You know, he was truly a blameless man, even as God certified Job. In Romans 12 and 1, talks about how we need to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. We need to make a decision to walk holy. It is a decision. If you have not made that decision, I want you to make that decision today. Even those who are watching over the internet, you can make that decision today to walk holy before God. Galatians 2 and 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. You know, crucifying our flesh on the cross. That way, if we have made that decision that I'm crucifying my flesh on the cross. Christ is the one who lives in me. That's how Paul is writing to the Galatians. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If we can crucify our flesh on the cross, then we can live a holy life. Then Christ is the one who's living in us and he is guiding us and he is leading us, he is speaking to us. And that's how we can overcome by making a decision to walk holy. Thank you, Jesus. In Genesis 39 and 9, I'm trying to wrap up now. There's a lot more, but I'm going to wrap it up. You know, we know the story of Joseph. 
You know, Joseph had to wait many years. He saw a dream that he, everyone of his family is bowing to him. And when he shared that with his family, they were not very happy about that. And he was sold to the Ishmaelites. They sold him to, uh, to Potiphar in Egypt. And, and then we know the story about uh, Potiphar's wife and how he ended up in prison. You know, even then, God was always with him. And I never saw, there is nothing in the scriptures which says that Joseph was frustrated or Joseph did not follow God. God was always with him. Even in the prison, you know, he was leading. I like the attitude. He knew that when we walk with integrity and honesty, when we walk with God, God will make a way out of the prison. And he was holding on and he was pursuing the dream that God had given him. And he was doing whatever he could even to lead in the prison. And even the jailer gave him all the responsibilities and he was probably relaxing. But because he was focused on helping the people around him. But then in Genesis 39 and 9, it talks about why he did not fall into that temptation. There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back, and he's talking about Potiphar, has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? He had made a decision. He had made a decision that he'll not sin against God. He had made a decision that he'll pursue God. He'll walk holy and pure. He will do his assignment. He'll pursue his assignment and he'll get to his destiny. Because if, if we fall into sin and, and it continues as a habit, there is a repercussion. We saw that in David's life. In fact, Job uh, talks about how your increase can be thwarted because of sin. You know, God might have a plan to increase you. So we need to all really examine ourselves that is there any sin in our lives? Is there any temptations that we have fallen into? And we can ask for forgiveness. Then we can make a decision, Lord, I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to walk holy and pure. I'm purposing in my heart not to defile myself. Let's all stand up. It's a time for decision. Even those who are watching over the internet today, I want to challenge all of us. Temptations come to everyone. But we do not have to succumb to the temptations. The Lord has given us a way out. When we fall into temptation, it's because of our own decision. But the Lord wants us to decide, and I'm not going to ask for a raising of hands. You, it's between you and God. Even those who are watching over the internet, it's between you and God. I just... In you, want in your heart to just acknowledge to God if there is anything that you need to repent of. And there is no condemnation in Christ. So don't feel bad. Everyone has fallen short of the glory of God. He's a God who is merciful. But we need to acknowledge that we have sinned against him. Like David acknowledged to Nathan, prophet Nathan. I have sinned. It is important to acknowledge because that releases you from that bondage. Because the enemy will keep hold of that bondage if we have not acknowledged the sin in our lives. Anything else? Anything else? We take a minute of silence to just examine ourselves. I am examining myself and each one here and those who are watching over the internet. Let's examine ourselves. And if there is any wicked way in me, as the psalmist says, if there is any wicked way in us, 
Let's ask for forgiveness and ask God to create in us a clean heart. Thank you, Mr. Lord. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this time. Thank you for the word of God. How it uh, teaches us, instructs us, shows us where we lack. It's a mirror. Help us to remember what we see in the mirror, not forget it. And make decisions for you, Lord. Thank you for teaching us on overcoming temptations. Help us, Lord, to walk holy and pure, to walk according to the word of God and be victorious in our lives. I pray for each one watching and each one here in the sanctuary that we will be victorious, we will be overcomers over temptation and we will walk according to the word of God. We will make a decision like Daniel made as he purposed in his heart to not defile himself. So we make a decision and purpose in our hearts to not defile ourselves. Strengthen us, Lord. Let us be strong in you and in the power of your might. And let us walk with you. Let us walk in the spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We will sit down and pray for a minute or two.